for the recording. All right. Well, we're looking at today at the book of Esther. The book of Esther. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. And we're going to kind of do a little bit of an overview and, and, and outline this this morning. And then hopefully we'll still have some time to get into the text itself. Uh, but just beginning in verse one, it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ashuerus, that is Ashuerus, which reigned from India even to Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. And in those days, when the king Asuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom, and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen, and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Of the seven, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zether, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains, Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. And God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So we're making a quite a transition. We've come from the book of Ruth, and we're now looking into the book of Esther. And there's definitely a different atmosphere. We've come from a quiet little Jewish town to a Gentile metropolis, We've come from the simple life of the, the country and agriculture uh, to a, a complex empire. Uh, we've come from the city gate uh, to affairs of state. And so we've made a huge transition in coming uh, from the book of Ruth into the book of Esther. There's no question, uh, just by way of general remarks, that Esther is the most secular of all the writings found in the Old Testament. Those who are interested in great theological subjects, uh, such as uh, theology proper and prophecy and, and uh, other such interesting topics, will search the pages of Esther in vain for really any help. It's never quoted in the New Testament or even alluded to in the New Testament, and the name of God does not appear once, at least it doesn't appear in uh, our translations, uh, we'll talk more about that la later, nor is the ritual of sacrifice ever mentioned. On, a, on some occasions where we would expect prayer to be made, it is noticeably absent, and so it's a, a really interesting book in that sense very secular 
Although it's it's also interesting to note that a couple of uh, prominent writers say this. One is John Wesley. He says, the name of God is not found in this book, but the finger of God is everywhere. <laughs> I like that. His name is not mentioned, but his finger is found everywhere. Another uh, prominent writer, G. Campbell Morgan, says, no one reads this book without being conscious of God. So he's not mentioned, but he's certainly very evident. And we'll think about how that all works out as we continue. The events in the book cover a period of approximately nine years. It demonstrates how the Lord worked on behalf of his people who remained in captivity. Now, again, these people who remained in captivity, uh, in a sense, they're, they're not exactly the most zealous for God. Uh, there are things, even the behavior at times of Mordecai and the things that he gets Esther involved in uh, causes to question. Uh, what we would say is that these people that stayed behind, they had an opportunity to return. Uh, when Cyrus made the decree that any Jew that wanted to go back and uh, with the purpose of rebuilding the temple, with the purpose of reestablishing Jerusalem, only 60,000 out of a population of approximately 2 million went back. These that stayed, they had settled down in Babylon. They kind of liked it. They liked the, uh, the, the Gentile world empire. And they, their conditions were relatively good in that empire. And so they certainly were people that lacked affection for the house of God, or else they would have gone to help build it. Uh, they were people that certainly uh, did not have a, a particular zeal for the place that God had chosen to place his name, or that city, uh, that city of the great king. They had every opportunity to go back, but they stayed put. So they're certainly a people that you would say were, were, were quite far from God. And yet, God in this book still honors the covenant that he made with the Jewish uh, patriarch Abraham. And what we see is God's faithfulness to the Abrahamic covenant. I just want to remind us of what God said uh, about Abraham and his descendants. We want to go back to a very key verse, actually, in interpreting the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, God's purposes for the descendants of Abraham. Genesis 12 and verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so God's intent is to keep his promises uh, that he made to Abraham and his descendants. And we're going to see that lived out in this very book. Uh, people who want to curse the Jews end up being cursed themselves, in a sense. And so it's a very interesting, interesting book. The author is unknown. Although whoever the author was, he did have access to the archives of the public records in Persia. And so uh, just to give you an example uh, that these public records were available to this writer. So perhaps some, some Chamberlain, some person uh, with uh, responsibilities in the empire. Chapter 2, verse 23, it says, And when Inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. And of course, this man seems to have access to these, this book of Chronicles, chapter 6, verse 1. 
On that night could not the king sleep, and the commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Chapter 9 of Esther and verse 32, 932, it says, And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. Chapter 10, verse 2, And all the acts of his power and of his might and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? And so whoever wrote this book was one of those people that were privy to this kind of information. Uh, perhaps, as we've said, one of the chamberlains who were responsible. Now, as we look at the outline, I'm just going to outline the book for us. And uh, we're going to look at it in a very simple way. Uh, in chapters one and two, we want to think about Esther's crowning. Okay, Esther's crowning. Uh, the king and his wives is the theme, really, of the first two chapters. And then in chapter three through five, we want to look at Haman's climbing. Uh, he's climbing the ladder, if you like. He's, uh, he's trying to get to the top, and he's making a pretty good job of it. In fact, he's going to be second only to the king. And so we're going to look at Haman's climbing, the exaltation of Haman, and, of course, uh, his, uh, his ambitions and all the rest of it, Haman's climbing. And then we want to look at chapter 6, and we'll see Haman's cringing. And you, that's an amazing chapter where uh, he's asked the question, what will we do with the man who the Lord uh, or the king delights to honor? And immediately he thinks it's himself. And so he makes this a decree of what should be done. And, of course, it's Mordecai who he has to parade through the capital city and you can just imagine him cringing every minute Haman's cringing and then in chapters again six through eight because the chapter six divides into uh, this Haman's cringing and then goes on to uh, Esther's courage throwing the banquet admitting she's a Jew to the king and pleading for his her people and so Esther's courage chapter six through eight, and then chapters nine through 10, the Jews celebration. And we're going to see this amazing celebration of victory over their enemies that continues uh, to this very day. So that's our basic theme. But we did say that even though God is not mentioned, we want to emphasize the unseen hand of God in the book of Esther. It's a, it's a book that teaches us about divine providence. And there are many books in the Bible that emphasize the providence of God. It's a wonderful teaching, wonderful doctrine, really. Uh, and we see God's providence in several ways. Yes, people make genuine choices, yet God is working things out to his own purpose and good. And so we see his, the unseen hand of God in placing Esther in a position of influence. Again, that's God's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes, putting Esther, this Jewish orphan, uh, in a position of influence where she becomes the queen. That's remarkable. Uh, in delaying the destruction of the Jews for almost a year through the casting of dice, basically, poor or poor from which poor him comes. Uh, and so delaying the destruction of the Jews for almost a year, that's the providence of God that allows time for God to maneuver and work in keeping the king awake so as to reward Mordecai. That's really going to be the turning point of the whole book, that chapter. And again, God is able to keep kings awake at night. And so he certainly we're going to see that. And then, finally, the unseen hand of God in promoting a despised Jew to the prime minister of the Medo-Persian Empire. Just another general remark um, about this amazing book, and that is this, that we see the rise and fall of the fortunes of each of the book's main characters. 
So there's a lot of kind of up and downs in this book. For instance, the king, Ahasuerus, exalted by the, the decadent display of his wealth uh, and the, uh, the, the power of his empire, is humiliated at the banquet by the refusal of Vashti to obey his demands. And so on the one hand, he's exalted to all this, this display of his greatness, his majesty, his power, and then he's humiliated because Vashti refuses to come at his bidding. And then Vashti, uh, she is exalted to be given the privilege of having a private banquet of her own for, for all the women, and then her fall is very dramatic to uh, being set aside and one of shame and divorce. And then you have Mordecai, elated at the promotion of Esther to be queen. And then not long afterwards, humiliated and crying in the street in dust and ashes like a child as he learns of Haman's decree. And so, again, the, the highs of, of seeing uh, Esther made queen to the lows of uh, hearing of the decree. Haman, he's exalted to the lofty heights by the king and then made to escort the man he detested and announced to all this is what the man the king delights to honor. Uh, and so how difficult that would have been for him, as we've already thought. And so, again, exaltation and then humiliation. And then the enemies of the Jews, they were exalted at the prospect of getting both the lives and the loot of all their enemies. And then they were humiliated when the Jews are allowed to defend themselves and 75,000 of their number are destroyed in defensive skirmishes. But it ends up with a high note, although of Mordecai and Esther and the Jews. It ends on a very high note for all three of these principal characters, Mordecai, Esther, and the Jews. We might say this just by way of practical application, that the Christian life has lots of ups and downs. Right, we've all be, we we've had mountaintop experiences, and we've also known what it is to be in the valley, and yet the Christian life ends on a high note, a definite high note. <laughs> We're caught up to meet the Lord. We see the Lord. We become like Him. I mean, that's a pretty high ending, isn't it? That's our final ending. Yeah, there's lots of ups and downs, but the final, the final aspect of the Christian life is a definite up. What I'd like to do is just make some comparisons between other books in the Bible and Esther, because it's just, it's interesting just to compare books. So Esther and Ruth, we've already come from the book of Ruth, but Ruth is how God can bring a, a, a poor Gentile in relationship with his people and into the royal family. And the book of Esther is how God can exalt the Jew to the highest place of honor among the Gentiles. By the way, both women, as we, we mentioned when we were doing the book of Ruth, were committed. Uh, th there was a point in their life where they made a big decision to, to follow after God in a, in a very specific way, a huge commitment. Ruth chapter 1 6, remember we said, or 1 16, uh, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. She made a big decision to go back to the land uh, with Naomi. And in Esther chapter 4 and verse 16, we see another very similar decision made by Esther. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And these tremendous words, if I perish, 
I perish. That was a moment of decision, a moment of commitment. And, and what we find in both of these amazing books is they're, they're, they're examples of women committed to God, but and they both yielded to the Lord. And it tells us God can use both the peasant and the powerful queens to accomplish his plan in the world if they will commit themselves to him. And isn't it wonderful that, that God is the God of the peasants and the queens? He's able to use whosoever he chooses if they will simply yield themselves to him. Another comparison is between Esther and the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. In either book, there's no mention of the Lord, yet both deal with God's love for his people. And so they're both significant. And then Esther and Exodus you might think, what is there to compare with these? Well, in both cases, the enemies of Israel plan to wipe out the people of God. Pharaoh's plan was by drowning. Remember, all the firstborn sons were to be drowned. And guess what happened to him? He ended up with his armies being drowned in the Red Sea. The very thing that he intended for the Jews came upon himself. Haman, by hanging, ended up on the gallows himself. himself. The Persians intended the slaughter of the Jews and were slaughtered themselves. Both enemies reaped what they sowed. In each case, the great deliverance was celebrated by a feast. In the book of Exodus, the feast of Passover celebrated God's great deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And then the book of Esther is celebrated by a feast called the Feast of Purim. Now, there's another not in our Bible, but in the Apocrypha, there's another example like this. And it's the story of Antiochus Epiphanes, who also sought to wipe out the Jews. And as a result of that, another feast was established that the Jews continue to this day, the Feast of Hanukkah or Hanukkah. And so it's just kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, that it was said of a uh, Soviet official was talking to a Jew and saying, what do you think would happen if we determined to wipe out the Jews in the Soviet Union? And the response was, it'll probably end up in a feast. <laughs> that was the reply of the Jew. It'll probably end up in a feast. Well, what about Esther and the book of Daniel? Daniel would not submit to the decree of the king and had to suffer for his stand. Mordecai refused to bow to Haman and likewise suffered. But Daniel ultimately was dressed in royal apparel and so was Mordecai. So again, some definite connections between these books. And then finally, uh, Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah. The amount of correspondence by letters passing between the rulers and the people fit these books together. The opposition of the enemy manifestly is shown toward the Jews. And then, of course, we see scenes in the great cities of Shushan in Esther and Jerusalem in Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, I guess the question we might ask is, where do, you, where do we actually place the book of Esther in Scripture? And it really fits between Ezra chapter 6 and chapter 7 historically. If you were looking at the book of Ezra, you would fit Esther in between chapter 6 and 7. It basically covers a period from 483 to 473 BC. Now we know all this because of the history of the kings of Medo-Persia. Uh, these are historical characters that we can verify from history. And so it's very easy to date the events of this particular book. So having said all these things, let's just say the final thing, the purpose of the book of Esther 
is to reveal the providence of God, working out his purpose wherever he wills. And even when men are unconscious of his doing it. Another interesting thought is even in the most adverse circumstances, the Jew eventually and ultimately prevails. I don't think there's a people on the planet that have had more attempts to eradicate them in history, and yet they still prevail. In fact, one man was asked, there's no, give us some evidence that the Bible is true. And his response was the Jew. <laughs> that was the evidence. God's amazing dealing with the Jew. The providence of God. This is a lovely definition that I came across. It says, providence is God's attention concentrated everywhere. Now think about that. Providence is God's attention concentrated everywhere. It was he's involved in everything. All the very details of, of life, he's involved. His attention concentrated everywhere. So let's look at the book of Esther. And we'll begin uh, working our way through this book. So in verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India to Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces. So let me just say that this king, he actually is better known to us in history as Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S, Xerxes, the son of Darius I, and the grandson of Cyrus. And the actual name Ahasuerus is a bit like the term Pharaoh uh, that we're familiar with, or Caesar. Uh, it's really, and it literally has the idea of king of kings. And of course, this man, uh, because he ruled over 127 provinces, I guess he saw himself as a king of kings. And so uh, basically, it's King Xerxes. <laughs> Uh, the son of Darius, the grandson of Cyrus. And these events that we're going to read in this book take place in the third year of his reign. We see that in verse three, in the third year of his reign. And so it says, so of course, just to remind ourselves, so we're dealing with, if you remember Daniel's uh, vision in chapter two, head of gold was Babylon, and then kind of the, the chest of silver. This is This is the empire we're dealing with. And actually, what's interesting is that this, this empire of silver is actually preparing to attack Greece, which would be the next part of that image. And so that's certainly a, a bit of the background of what we're seeing here. The, the size of this empire, when it says India, it really is the area where the Indus River, flo Indus River flows. And so today it would be what we'd call West Pakistan. Is, is how far this empire went uh, to West Pakistan and then, of course, into Ethiopia. So a tremendous empire. And, and actually, what's going on behind the scenes is he's planning to attack Greece because he wants to bring the whole of Europe under his empire. And what he's looking to do is have a one-world empire of which he is king of kings. And that's kind of interesting from a prophetic standpoint, isn't it? Uh, it's kind of foreshadowing a day when there will be a one world ruler who will proclaim himself to be, as it were, the king of kings. And so that certainly is the idea behind this. 127 provinces. Now, we're told historically that these 127 provinces, uh, they were what they call satrapsy. A satrap was a, a kind of administrative district. There were 20 of them, but then it was divided further into 127 promise provinces. And one thing that the Medes and Persians were good at was administration. They were very good at administra administrating their empire. And then it says that in those days when the king, verse 2, Ahasuerus, was sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. So, so what we're seeing is that when he says when he was sat on the throne, the idea is that his throne was established. He's, he's three years king now, and all possible uh, rivals, uh, contestants for the throne have been dealt with. 
and he is now firmly established on the throne as king. And so he's sitting in Shushan, the palace. Now, interestingly enough, there were three capitals of the Medo-Persian Empire. There's one that we know here, Shushan, or uh, other translations have it as Susa. And then there's Ekbatana, and then there's Babylon. Those were the three main capitals of the empire. And Shushan was the winter residence. It was uh, so, of course, this would be in northern Iran. And apparently in the summertime, it's so warm that even reptiles uh, get burnt up. It's, so so it, this is the winter residence of the king and his palace. And so it says in the third year of his reign, uh, verse three, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Medea, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. So this, this incredible banquet is, is set out. Now this, this uh, of course, a great theme, by the way, in the book of Esther, is feasts. We're going to see it all the way through. In fact, in this chapter, there are three distinct feasts that are mentioned in chapter one. And so uh, we're going to see it all the way through. So here in verse three, and then it says, verse five, and when these days were expired, the king made a feast to all the people that were present in Shushan. Uh, again, for another, this is a seven day feast, so 187 days. And then uh, while that's going on, verse 9, also Vashti the queen, verse 9, made a feast. So there's three feasts going on in this chapter. But elsewhere in chapter 2 and verse 18, we see some more feasting. It says, then the king made a great, great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. So this one's a marriage feast when... Uh, he uh, makes Esther to be his queen. And then chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And the post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. So here's a, a little feast going on between uh, Haman and the king, uh, they're, they're feasting while the decree goes out to execute all the Jews. But nevertheless, yet another feast is mentioned here. And then <clears throat> we notice in chapter 5 and chapter 7, we have more feasts. There are banquets that Esther prepared. Uh, verse, chapter 5, verse 4. Uh, Esther answered, if it seemed good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Verse 5, the king said, cause Haman to make haste and come to the banquet. Verse 6, and the king said to Esther, the banquet. And so all the way through chapter 5, you've got the banquet. Uh, you have, again, uh, the same idea in verse 7. It says, so the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther the queen. And again, all the way through chapter 7, you have the reference to the word banquet. Chapter 8, verse 17. It says, and in every province, in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. That's the feast that we call today the feast of Purim chapter 9 now finally verse 17 through 19 it says on the 13th day of the month Adar and on the 14th day of the same rested day and made it a day of feasting and gladness but the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof and on the 14th thereof and in the 15th day of the same they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwell in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar, the day of gladness and feasting, and a good day, and of sending portions 
one to another. And so what we find is this book begins with a feast that lasts six months and ends with a feast that is established called the Feast of Purim that has been going on for centuries. And so it's kind of an interesting book. Feasting is a great theme of the book of Esther. God is not only the God of the fields in the book of Ruth, but he's the God of the feasts in the book of Esther. So that's a great theme that we're going to see. So why is the king holding this feast? Now, let me just say about this 180 days. And um, I think it would be good just to say this, that I, I believe what he's doing here, he's, he's preparing to invade Greece. And he wants to get all of the administrators throughout the kingdom on his side. And the way he's going to do that is going to put on this impressive banquet. Now, it's not that all of the uh, administrators from all the 127 provinces were there, because that would be uh, a security risk for the empire, wouldn't it? To have all of the key officials absent for six months consecutively uh, from their posts, it may well cause all kinds of security issues. So what I believe is going on here is that he's, he's through this feast that's gone over a period of six months. And during that six months period, on a circulating basis, people from different provinces come and are wined and dined and entertained by the king. And I suppose part of the way it works is this, that uh, if a, a, a salesman wants to sell you something, uh, you know, some some business salesperson, they'll often take you out to a really fancy restaurant and they'll wine you and dine you to try and kind of sweeten the deal and make you accept. Well, this is exactly what King Ahasuerus is doing. He's bringing all his officials over this six month period. They're all coming. They're seeing the magnificence uh, of the capital. Uh, they're, they're seeing the opulence and the wealth of the king. And it's to, to get them to see that this we can do this. We can, we can defeat Greece. Now, there's a reason why he wants to attack Greece. And that is he's already done it once. So well, his father did. And tragically, his father was killed by the Macedonians. And so he is desperate to get revenge on his father. You say, well, how do we know all that? We don't see any of it in the text. Well, we know it because of a uh, historian called Hero Herodotus. And Herodotus tells us the background of all these feasts. Now, God doesn't tell us it because God's purpose is not to go into those details. They're irrelevant. God's purpose is to show us how did this orphan girl, Esther, ever become the queen of uh, Medo-Persian Empire? And so that's God's purpose. But the historical background is whining and dining, getting people ready, uh, showing them how impressive the king is so that they can make this attack on the Grecian Empire, which, by the way, would fail. And uh, he will come back sulking and he will take comfort in his harem as a result of the disaster of the Greek campaign. So that's kind of the, uh, the whole historical background. But certainly the invasion of Greece is at the back of his mind. And so over a six month period in a rotating schedule, the various emperors or, or various um, administrators of the empire come. And it says, when these days, days were expired, so this 180 period, day period is up, the king now makes a feast to all the people who are present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So it's a royal garden party. And this royal garden party, again, it's especially now for the palace, for Shushan. Uh, again, it was a city 
uh, and of course the palace was in there, but it, but all the important officials of the city were invited to this, uh, both great and small. All the people, because again, they're going to be they've got to be behind the king for this mission. Uh, Shushan, as we said, it was the winter residence. It literally, the word means lily. Apparently, it was a very beautiful city, and it is decorated especially. Uh, and again, the writer seems to be writing from an eyewitness perspective as he describes the city. And that's why we think he's one of the Chamberlains, because he's he's giving details, intimate details of what this place was like as it was done up and decorated for these events. And so he says in verse six, uh, where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rings and pillars of marble beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble and they gave them drink in vessels of gold the vessels being diverse one from another and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king or at the king's expense and so again what an amazing description from the marble the pillars uh, the hangings I mean, this is very impressive. And of course, it's all purpose. And look at look how strong we are. Look how wealthy we are. We can do this. We can, we can defeat the Greeks. This is not a problem for us. And so part of it is to show off, again, all of this wealth and all of this ability. And again, what does scripture say? Pride cometh before a fall. And certainly, here's... Uh, and again, we have to remind ourselves, remember when the Lord Jesus met the serpent, uh, the, the, the devil uh, in the wilderness, and he, he, he showed the Lord Jesus all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them in a moment of time. And he said, all these things will I give to you if you simply bow down and worship me. And certainly... Uh, the kingdoms of this world know how to put on a show. As a, an Englishman, I have to say, I think the, the Brits can do a pretty good job with all their royal uh, kind of uh, uh, ceremonies and rituals. And they, they certainly know how to put a show on. And certainly this is what's going on here. There's a definite show going on. And so... It says also drink is allowed to flow freely, although nobody's compelled. And, and even the cups, they're, they're gold drinking vessels. And everyone's different. Everyone's unique. They're not just one pattern. That's, everyone has got a unique design. Now, it's interesting that the Jewish Targum says that the vessels of gold were taken from the temple in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC. Now, we, we can't, that's what the Jewish commentary, the Jewish Targum has to say. Certainly, that was the case scripturally in Daniel chapter 5 at Belshazzar's feast, but we can't be dogmatic about it here other than just to, to throw that comment in that the Jewish Targum seems to indicate that uh, that's where these cups came from. So verse 8, the drinking was according to the law, none did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. So there's no, there's no compulsion. If you don't want to drink freely, you don't have to, but it's available for everybody, and everybody has the option. And also is a third feast. So you had this 180-day revolving feast, and then you had the feast of seven days that is going on uh, for the officials and for, for the ordinary people of Shushan. But there's a separate feast going on for the women. And Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So lots of feasting going on. And then it tells us in verse 10, on the seventh day, now it's a seven-day feast, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. And so the king 
has had too much to drink. And so we're going to see, not only, we're going to learn something about this king. First of all, he controls an empire of 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, but he can't seem to control himself. In fact, we're going to learn two things about him. He can't hold his liquor. <laughs> and secondly, he's an angry man. His, his issue with alcohol and his issue with anger. And so Xerxes' drunkenness here. His heart was merry with wine. And he commands, and he commands his seven chamberlains, and these would be eunuchs. Um, and this was certainly a practice amongst um, the Medes and the Persians uh, that these kind of officials would be made eunuchs for several reasons. One is because they would be interacting with the royal harem, but secondly, because they they he didn't want them to have a rival dynasty of their own. Some of these people could climb very high, as we see from Haman. The idea they didn't want them to uh, have a rival dynasty. So uh, there were, in this case, uh, would have been eunuchs. And so they're told to go on an errand on his behalf, these seven chamberlains. By the way, it's interesting that the Jews love the number seven. It's very significant in Jewish uh, numerology. But the Persians also loved the number seven. It's very significant in Persian um, numerology. So there are seven chamberlains. And so it says, <clears throat> their, their mission, verse 11, to bring Vashti, the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty for she was fair to look upon and so he's had a lot to drink he's shown all his wealth and all his opulence and now he wants to show off his wife and she was a beauty by all accounts her name means beauty or the best one and so she she clearly was a stunner she was a looker and he wanted to put her on display now again there's some thought uh, uh at least some suggest that there's some imp impropriety here he'd like her to not only show herself off but show herself off in a sensual manner uh, we can't be dogmatic about that but nevertheless he wants her at his command to come and to show off her beauty and to all uh, those that were invited to the feast. It says <clears throat> that the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him this man has an anger issue we, we see it here his anger burns within him but i want us just to see throughout the book there are outbursts of anger from the king chapter 3 and verse 5 it says and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not down did, and did him reverence, and Haman was full of wrath. So again, there's Haman who's angry there. Chapter 5, verse 9. It says, Then went Haman forth that, that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai the king, at the king's gate, then he stood not up nor moved for him. He was full of indignation against Mordecai. 7-7. It says, then the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went unto the palace garden and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined again against him by the king. And then chapter seven, verse 10. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So we got some hot-tempered guys here. The king and Haman are men that have an issue 
an ang what we'd say they they probably need some anger management help <laughs> uh, they're guys that can get pretty angry now again i want to think of some bigger principles here uh, first of all i want to think about the drink aspect uh, remember the heart of the king is merry with wine and as a result, he wants to do something that would actually be quite humiliating for his wife to parade her before all the men as like this, this object. Uh, um, uh, so, so again, just what does drink do? Uh, Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, wine is a mocker. It really, it really does. And if you, if you think of how many problems in our world are caused by drunkenness and anger now i know there's lots of other things but drunkenness and anger have caused many a marriage to be torn apart caused many a, a a person to be devastated as a result of these things and so certainly we see this is a this is a problem uh, that is is brought before us here this this drunkenness and of course, um, we can, from scripture, uh, as we've talked about before, uh, say that abstinence is demanded by scripture. But what we can say is that drunkenness is always condemned by scripture. And so th there must be self-control when it comes to alcohol. And of course, um, some of us have had more of a propensity to drunkenness in times past, we find that the best way to not get drunk is to not drink, <laughs> and, and it's the safest way. And, uh, and so we just need to be aware of the dangers of drink. And we might say, too, that the Queen Vashti refused to come. Was part of it, remember, she's been having a feast as well for the women. Could alcohol have played a part in her having the courage to refuse the king's demand so we, we certainly know that it has a, a part to play here and so does anger just look a couple of verses about anger that i think it would be good for us to consider let's look at the book of proverbs of course full of uh, wonderful wisdom and has something to say about this matter uh, of anger and not being able to control it. Proverbs 16, 32. Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. And then Proverbs 25 and verse 28. He says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In other words, a defenseless city. Uh, he, he, he can be attacked at will, so to speak. And so he that has no rule over his own spirit. And so, again, we just we need to ask ourselves a question. Is that an issue? Um, it, don't think that God's people are not immune from anger issues and don't think assemblies have not been torn apart in times past by men who could not control their anger okay so we need to say lord help me in this area the fruit of the spirit if i'm under the control of the holy spirit is self-control and i will be able to keep that anger from being uh, devastating and of course, we recognize that there is such a thing as a righteous anger. And when it's the difference between the two is a righteous anger is connected with God's interests, not mine. It's not about me. It's about him and his honor. And we better be sure that it really is righteous indignation, that it's about the Lord's honor that's at stake and not my pride that has been dented or my pride that has been hurt. So in this case, there's in a sense, on the part of Vashti, there's a triple whammy here. I mean, what she's doing in refusing, uh, she, there are three issues. A woman is challenging the authority 
of the map. Right? We, we, we know that uh, certainly um, in the ancient world, uh, man, it was a patriarchal society, and man was to rule over his own household. So a woman challenging the authority of a man, a wife disobeying her husband, and then a subject disobeying the king. And so in all of those things, uh, this, a woman um, challenging the authority of, of men, which is, you know, because there's a, there's a bigger principle here. If, if, if the queen does this, then what's, what's the trickle-down effect going to be with others? A wife disobeying a husband, a subject in defiance of the king. And again, we ask the question, was she emboldened by strong drink? And so it tells us that the king's was very wroth and his anger burned in him. But we will have to wait till next week to see what's the outcome of the king's anger. And he's going to do something that I believe he's going to greatly regret. And so we'll have to wait until then. But in the meantime, while we wait, may the Lord help us to be in control of our anger, <laughs> that we will not allow it to cause devastation amongst God's people. Amen.